everybody. My name is Madalina. I'm from Romania. I'm an engineer in computer science, and I did a PhD in my 30s. Um, I have been working for 10 years in machine learning, and currently I am heading the data science department at Kiwi.com. Who had to work on a project requiring you to learn fast an intimidatingly complicated topic while most available tutorials refer to older methods and very little of the challenges that you are actually going to face? I did. And this is why I'm here today, to give you a fast track into the fascinating world of anomaly detection. Thanks. So, we will check what anomaly detection is, what challenges you are expected to encounter, how you can mitigate them, what data sets you can leverage to benchmark your results, what is the correct way to evaluate these results, what libraries can get you started as soon as possible. I also prepared a GitHub repo that is going to exemplify all the techniques I will discuss today. However, the time is limited, and in my attempt to provide a 360 degrees up-to-date overview of the field, the content cannot be complete. It will reflect my personal preferences. However, it is a starting point, and I hope it will also help you save a lot of time. Without any further ado, what is anomaly detection? It is the identification of rare events that deviate from our expectation of normal data, or in liars. And it comes in two flavors. Outlier detection, when we focus on abnormal samples that already contaminate the training set. And novelty, when we refer to new and unseen patterns in the data that didn't already make it in the training set that we gathered. Anomaly detection is a key ingredient to observability. Observability is a paradigm understanding a system's internal state through the usage of logs, metrics, and traces. However, it goes deeper than monitoring because it attempts to understand the why behind what is being observed, to anticipate problems, and thus to move from reactive too proactive. And this is achieved through different techniques, among which anomaly detection, drift detection, root cause analysis. These techniques help us build models that are reliable and have a reduced downtime. However, drift detection and anomaly detection are close topics, and they can be easily confused. To clarify, given our expectation of normal data or of inliers, anomalies refer to individual points that deviate from the normal data, while drift refers to a shift in the overall distribution of the data over time. So they are different phenomena with different detection methods. If you're interested in drift, this is not a topic of my presentation, but I suggest checking out the library Alibi Detect. Why should you care about anomaly detection? Because it is ubiquitous. It is relevant in all industries and across all types of data. If you work with tabular data, for example, the omnipresent scenario is fraud detection or inventory management. If you work with images in surveillance, we have uh, intrusion detection. In life sciences, uh, disease detection. On time series data, predictive maintenance, the analysis of financial markets, network security, healthcare monitoring, and many more. The remaining content of my presentation will focus on the analysis of time series data However, most of the methods that I will present today can also generalize to the other types of data. How can you, we solve anomaly detection? There are three big settings. First, if you are extremely lucky and you have only annotated data, 
It's the supervised setting in which you can train a binary classifier for normal data versus anomalous data. But most likely, you will have only partially labeled data together with a large quantity of unlabeled data. This is the semi-supervised setting. Or even more likely, you will lack any annotation at all. This is the unsupervised setting, which is also uh, the most uh, technically difficult one and the focus on my, of my presentation. So, uh, from all different scenarios and experimental settings, my presentation will focus on the unsupervised anomaly detection of multivariate time series data. I know this is a mouthful, so let's go through each of these individual terms, explain what they mean, check what problems or opportunities they bring, and then I will also explain why I chose this particular setting. As I mentioned, in the industry, it's rare to get uh, annotated data. Most, label, most data is unlabeled. Uh, and when uh, we do have it, it can be of poor quality. So fixing anomaly detection in the unsupervised setting is the most versatile and general, general <laughs> the case that generalizes uh, easiest. However, in the absence of ground truth data, it can be difficult to validate the results and also to find the appropriate threshold that would discriminate from anomalous data uh, and normal data. More on how to address uh, these challenges in a minute. The anomaly detection part um, is expected to bring the computational challenge of extreme class imbalance because anomalies are rare events. Additionally, it can also be challenging to discriminate anomalies from the expected noise in the data. The time series part refers to the fact that real data, both um, normal data and anomalies, evolve over time. And if we look at it from the perspective of this temporal evolution, we uh, can identify different types of anomalies using different detection methods. For example, on a point level, uh, we can have uh, global anomalies or contextual, but they can also be related to a recurrent pattern. This pattern can be seasonal, related to the trend, or even more generally, to any kind of uh, shapelet. And the multivariate part refers to uh, the fact that we are analyzing more than one time series at a given moment in time. We have multiple time series and the values of these time series relate to one another. And this uh, brings uh, the challenge known as the curse of dimensionality. Because we have multiple time series, each of them having a potentially significant dimensionality. So, uh, the remaining part of my presentation will focus on uh, the following setting. You are given n time series of an arbitrary length and no further information. Your mission is to identify when at least one of these time series exhibits anomalous behavior either by itself or in relation to the other uh, given time series. Why did I choose this particular subscope? Because it's the one that contains the fewest um, available tutorials or blogs. Uh, it can be addressed through a variety of ways. It's the one that is closest to what you will experience in the industry, most likely in uh, fraud detection, in predictive maintenance. It's highly versatile and generalizable. If you have an unsupervised solution, you can always uh, leverage it in combination with the other semi-supervised and supervised settings. And it's also the one that brings the most difficult technical challenges. Before uh, jumping into Python methods, let's do a quick refresh of the theory uh, behind uh, anomaly detection algorithms. 
Different surveys, including the one cited here, group the approaches into five categories. First, uh, even if we are in the unsupervised setting, we want to learn a binary decision boundary on our data. So we want to split samples into anomalies and normal data. And in doing so, uh, most likely, we will need to provide extra information. For example, an expected rate of contamination in your data set. It's possible that in practice, you don't know this information and its value is going to tremendously affect the result of uh, the algorithm. The methods in uh, this category work best with tabular data, like most of the research in anomaly detection is focused mostly on tabular data. If you work with time series data, you can still handle it. For example, instead of considering a sample, uh, a snapshot at a given moment in time, you can look at um, a rolling window um, around that, uh, that sample. The handbook uh, methods that uh, we learn at school are isolation forest, one class uh, support vector machines. In the second approach, we want to relax the condition of binary classification to a probability. So we want to predict the probability for the density function of normal data. Similarly, these methods work best with tabular data. If you have other kinds of data, you can still uh, transform it uh, in, in, in such a shape. Um, the outstanding methods here are local outlier factor or clustering. For example, you can cluster your data set using density-based um, clustering or Gaussian mixture model, and all the points that will fall outside the identified clusters would be considered anomalies. In the third approach, we look at the distance between a sample and all its neighbors, and we want to determine a threshold for the distance beyond which a sample is considered uh, far enough to be an anomaly. For example, if we work with time series data, a very common method uh, is the Bollinger Bands. In this case, we want to look at the distance between a sample and, for example, the rolling mean average or uh, any other metric. If you want to compute distances between uh, time series, you can check dynamic time uh, warping as a distance metric. Finally, in reconstruction, we want to train a model that is able to predict the current state of the data or to reconstruct it. And here, the intuition is that when we start getting large reconstruction errors, this signals the presence of anomalies. The typical methods uh, can be simple, like PCA or Kellner PCA, but can also be methods that leverage neural networks, for example, autoencoders or generative adversarial neural networks. And in the final approach, if before we were trying to predict the present state of the data, we want to predict now the future. We want to predict how the data is going to evolve if it is coming from the normal distribution that we already observed. And similarly, when we start getting errors, this means that anomalies start occurring. The typical methods in this case can be autoregressive models like ARIMA, as well as methods that are based on recurrent neural networks or more recently, transformers. You might have noticed that across all these five categories of approaches, we have the recurrent topic of thresholding. Um, how do we find a distance or a contamination rate that would split anomalies from normal data? In some cases, you can leverage uh, business knowledge in order to set the right threshold. But very often, this information is not known in advance. And in that case, you can check non-parametric dynamic thresholding, which is a set of unsupervised methods that leverage different statistical tests that avoid making assumptions on the data distribution. Uh, these thresholds can also uh, adjust over time, can also uh, evolve over time. Uh, if this is of interest uh, to you, I suggest checking out the library called PyThresh. Uh, it's amazing, it comes with 30 algorithms for uh, non-parametric dynamic thresholding. 
Okay, now let's get our hands dirty. We checked the algorithms and we want to apply them on some data sets. A very good starting point to benchmark your results is AD Bench. AD Bench is a collection of 57 uh, benchmark data sets that have been uh, curated and annotated and they come from pretty much all industries and they have been published together with um, the library PyOD. More about it in a minute. You have the algorithms, uh, you have the data, how should you evaluate these results? The first point is that there are different dimensions you should consider. First and foremost, you should care about the correctness of your algorithm, of course. You are in the unsupervised setting. If you do have a few labeled samples, it's best to put them in the test set and then you should use uh, the performance metrics that are related to extreme class imbalance because anomalies are rare. So in this case, you should compute AUC, F1 score, precision, recall. If you don't have any samples at all to compute model correctness, then you can check anomaly injection. Anomaly injection is a technique of artificially creating anomalies, inserting them, injecting them in your data set, and then using these samples in order to compute a measure of model correctness. The next point is model size. This is going to influence the prediction speed, especially if you are in the streaming scenario or in real time, you also want to have a very fast response time. And lastly, model stability. Model stability across runs, this also tells a lot about how reliable your algorithm can be. Point adjustment is a method that is uh, commonly used in scientific papers and it consists of um, further tuning the detection uh, thresholds over a rolling window in order to be able to detect uh, subtle anomalies. However, there is also a lot of criticism about this method, but most of uh, scientific publications still use it because it provides a significant boost to the scores that are being reported. And I think it's important for you to know that uh, this method exists. Uh, it can be applied and uh, it has these uh, interesting side effects. Okay, we are at EuroPython and I described a number of approaches. Uh, now, let's uh, see what libraries uh, you can use in order to uh, perform uh, anomaly detection today. I grouped um, these existing libraries into uh, six uh, categories uh, based on um, different uh, focus or perspective you can consider while handling uh, anomaly detection. In the first category, we can always start with good old sklearn. It comes with most uh, algorithms that I already mentioned uh, in the first uh, section implemented, including isolation forest, uh, the clustering methods. However, um, my uh, favorite go to Python library is PyOD. Why is that? Well, it comes with 50 algorithms for anomaly detection on tabular data. It has a tremendous collection of uh, contributions and it also contains extensions if you work with time series data, if you work with graph data, or if you work with big data in a scalable way. In the second category of approaches, you want to focus on the time series nature of your data. And as you can imagine, this means checking methods that perform time series forecasting or reconstruction. While there are numerous Python libraries uh, working with time series data, most of them focus on univariate data or analyzing a single time series. But if you have multiple time series that you want to analyze at uh, uh, the same time, you are in the multivariate uh, case, I suggest checking out the library Dart. Um, it supports multivariate forecasting uh, and it brings 40 uh, forecasting algorithms, including uh, very uh, recent uh, contributions. An alternative approach, if you work with time series data, is feature engineering. It's a bit like cheating. It's using uh, an approach to extract from your time series data features about the temporal evolution and transform your time series data into a tabular data set. 
For example, you can check TS Fresh, which given as input a time series data is able to produce up to 1,200 features that represent the nature, the temporal nature of the time series data. For example, information about seasonality, about trend, about uh, stationarity, pretty much everything. And why should you consider this? Because in this case, you would transform your time series data set into a tabular data set, and this opens the door to use the multitude of research and methods uh, that have been created for tabular data. This library also provides functionalities for um, missing data imputation and different transformations. In the third setting, you want to uh, fix anomaly detection, but in the case of real time. You have to handle also huge amounts of data coming at a very high uh, speed, uh, having uh, limited uh, memory. So in this case, what you should uh, consider is moving from um, an approach where you would have a precise solution, but slow, to an approximate solution, where you would uh, leverage, for example, only summaries of the data or sketches. And as you can imagine, this also brings its own algorithms for streaming. Um, my favorite algorithms uh, for anomaly detection in the streaming uh, setting are Lightweight Online Detector uh, and Xtreme. They function in a similar way by first reducing the dimensionality of the data using, for example, a random projection and then applying a technique to identify anomalies. If you are in the streaming setting, I suggest checking out the library PySAD, uh, Streaming Anomaly Detection. This comes with 16 algorithms for anomaly detection dedicated to streaming, as well as ensemblers. Ensemblers offer you the possibility to put together the results of more um, algorithms into a single prediction. In this approach, uh, we uh, want to look at the shotgun uh, solution, uh, AutoML. Uh, instead of checking out uh, different uh, libraries, maybe we want to throw uh, an AutoML capability at it. Uh, I recommend checking out the package called PyCaret because it has an extension dedicated to anomaly detection where you can leverage 12 algorithms and see which one works best on your data set. Most of them work with tabular data. If you have other kinds of data, you can use a method to transform it into tabular data and then you can uh, use any one of them. But in this case, uh, nothing prevents you from using also hyperparameter optimization on the set of algorithms uh, that uh, you like uh, best. In this approach, uh, not only that you want to do anomaly detection, but you want to deploy the latest and greatest. Uh, the cutting edge uh, contributions that usually make it first to conferences. But in that case, they have implementations in private GitHub repos, which are not very well maintained, and thus, it's quite risky to adopt them in the industry. The very good news is that there's this library in Python, DepotD, that did a fantastic job of publishing 27 algorithms that have been presented at conferences over the last two years. And as you can see, they did an amazing job of hiding the typical complexity of uh, research repositories under very clean interfaces. And lastly, LLMs. Uh, as you know, this topic is hype today. A uh, survey um, cited here uh, asked the question, can we leverage uh, zero-shot LLMs in order to perform anomaly detection? And they checked two approaches, uh, prompt engineering and forecasting. They uh, tried it uh, on 11 data sets, and the experimental results indicate that they underperform by 30% traditional state of the art, which is not to be um, surprised about, because even if LLMs have this multitasking capability, they were not designed for the task of anomaly detection. And um, they can't uh, be very good uh, at, at this job. However, if you have your data set, you can still perform uh, fine tuning, uh, but this would come with a significant investment. Finally, 
we looked at different approaches, uh, a variety of ways to crack anomaly detection. The last piece of the puzzle is why did they happen and what can we do about them? Root cause analysis. There is a plethora of libraries out there, but most of them perform cross-correlation between input features and the predicted anomaly status. However, we all know that correlation is not causation. If you're interested in a true causal analysis, I recommend checking out the library DoI. Uh, DoI um, provides you the possibility to even measure causal effects to play what-if scenarios, but it also requires you to create a causal graph as input. And very often, you don't know how to create this causal graph uh, on a given data set. In this case, you can check causal discovery. Causal discovery is a method that, uh, in an observational way, would create this causal graph from the data that was already gathered. So uh, in this case, uh, you can check the library causal learn. To conclude, anomaly detection is um, a topic of uh, underestimated uh, complexity at all phases in the life cycle of uh, machine learning uh, models. While th there are numerous approaches, uh, Python libraries, uh, algorithms, there is still no silver bullet because each data set has its own specificities. To address uh, this gap, I created a GitHub repo where you can just uh, plug in uh, your data set and see at least from uh, the methods that I presented today, which one works best for you. However, bear in mind that this will only be the beginning of your journey in the treacherous world of anomaly detection. I would like to thank Kiwi for supporting me in delivering this um, presentation. If you're interested in other uh, tech uh, content, please check the QR code. Also, very good news, we are hiring Pythonistas, so uh, feel free to come and uh, chat with us uh, at our booth. Uh, if you have any questions about uh, anomaly detection or any other machine learning question, uh, I am here, so you can ask me now or feel free to drop me an email to add me on LinkedIn. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we are almost out of time, but we'll take one very quick question, just one question. Everything was crystal Great. clear. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.